Welcome to the Radical Brilliance Podcast with Arjuna Arda and brilliant guests from around the world who are contributing to the evolution of humanity. Today's guest is Bill Gladstone, who's going to talk to us about whether you should write a book. So here's your host, Arjuna Arda. Hey, welcome back to the Radical Brilliance podcast. Today's uh, conversation is actually with my literary agent, Bill Gladstone, who was responsible for A New Earth by uh, Eckhart Tolle, um, for um, The Success Principles, Jack Canfield. He's uh, also the book Tidying Up. I forget the name of the author. It was a Japanese, young Japanese woman. But he has been responsible for some of the most uh, influential books. I think he calculated that about... Uh, I think about two and a half billion books have been sold altogether that he was an agent for. So publishing is changing a lot. Many of the clients I work with work with me because they want to, they want to create a book and um, they are very unsure. You know, should they publish, should, should you publish yourself? Should you go for a New York house? Do you get an agent? What should you do? So Bill today will be able to shine a light on the, the decisions you need to make, the considerations you need to bring into the picture to write the book that you most want to create. Hey Bill. It's good to see you. Good to see you mate. Thank you for taking the time. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, well, you know, besides being my very much valued and esteemed and beloved literary agent, you've actually, you've uh, accomplished some amazing miracles in the publishing world over the years. Well, we don't consider them miracles, though if you watch Shakespeare in Love, anything to do with theatrics is considered a miracle to stay in business. Right. It was one of my favorite lines from the movie. But in the world of publishing, I have to admit, we've been incredibly fortunate. So there's New Earth with Eckhart Tolle, right? New Earth with Eckhart Tolle. Tidying Up. Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. And then the whole Dummies. Thing. The Dummy series. You started the idea of Dummies, right? Well, my clients, yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, I represented it, I shepherded it. But and, you are yeah. officially the original dummy. Probably because I knew nothing about technology. Right. When I sold that book, I didn't even own a computer. Cool. Um, and yeah, no, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. I mean, and there's so many different ways you can measure it. We've aged over 10,000 different titles. We've 10,000 different titles. Wow. And we've generated over $5 billion, with a B, dollars in retail sales. With oh, a B and two L's. Yeah. Yeah. And over $500 million for our author clients. Wow. So, you know... For a small company with not many employees, it's an amazing accomplishment. You could so very... actually hang a sign up right here. <laughs> on, like McDonald's. <laughs> on, 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 on Oxford Avenue and put, you could say, books are us. And yeah, you, you, yeah you we're, it's, 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 it's very true. And um, best of all is not just the numbers, but I would say that at least 99.9%, .9%, if not 100% of the books that we've been responsible for as an agent have contributed in a positive way, not just to the authors and the publishers, but to the actual readers. Right. So all our books about technology enabled people to learn how to use it quickly and effectively. And then the main area of books right now, and uh, we used, business used to be our second biggest category, but now it's really what they call mind, body, spirit. Well, just think yeah. of the service you've done to sock drawers. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Socks are much more organized. Oh, right? that's just Marie. That's yeah. just one book. But, yeah, right. <laughs> but important. I, but. Think, I think you're going to get an award someday. But <laughs> services to sock organization. Perhaps. <laughs> but anyway, you know a lot about books. So, I, mm -hmm. so in, in, in a nutshell. So I wanted to talk to you today about the state of the book, you know, because obviously books have been through this 
Mm -hmm. massive shift in their relevance and the amount they're read and the amount that are produced. I mean, nothing has changed. No industry has changed more than books. Well, the biggest change in the book publishing industry is that one company now accounts for more than 50% of all revenue in North America. And that's Amazon? And that's Amazon. Right. If you combine the print book... I would have thought it's more like 80. I'm surprised it's only 50. Well... Where does the rest go? Well, you still have some bookstores. You do? You have a few. (laughs) And you you still have some other online companies which are selling books. Still 50%? Over 50%. Right. right. Over 50% of all revenue from... And that includes e-books and print books. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're number one in both categories. In the e-book category, the last figure I had heard was 85 percent for kindle yeah. for kindle right and i'm sure in terms of we think about self-published books which is probably what we're going to focus on mm-hmm. more today i'm sure that figure must be much higher than i i uh, author house is a hundred million dollar a year company so that's oh, okay. that's there's some significant players um but that, you're probably right i'm sure it's much more than 50 percent because Last I heard, I think Amazon was doing over 100,000 self-published titles a year. Right. I happen to be good friends with the individual who created CreateSpace and sold it to Amazon. Oh, they've really? Now, they've now folded. I thought it was founded by Amazon. No, the Amazon, it's like all the big companies take credit for founding things. All they did CreateSpace has now been folded into KDP. Exactly, right. yeah. Well, let's talk generally about the, the, the state of the book today. And I, before we go any further... I, I want to just reminisce for a second with you, mm-hmm. like, like for, for a little bit of old Lang Syne here. I want to remember the moment when I realized that there was no turning back. I just couldn't <laughs> have anyone but Bill Gladstone as my agent. And that was the moment that I sat right here mm-hmm. on your sofa. And on the, the coffee table, there was a signed copy of 100 Years of Solitude by Mark Hess. Yeah, that's actually, I still have that book and it's, you know... If there were a fire, it's probably the only possession I would right. take. Right. Because Before your wife. Well, I, she's, she's not a possession. possession. Come on, we're living in the new world. <laughs> but, um, in terms of my relationship with Gabriel García Márquez, I had a relationship with him long before I ever met him. I wrote my thesis at Yale I remember on uh, Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude. You studied Spanish literature? I st- studied Spanish literature at Yale. Uh, I actually won an award for the essay I wrote comparing Cien Años de Soledad with Don Quixote. Mm-hmm. And uh, they even paid me some money. I won some big prize. I forget what it's called. I graduated highest possible honors and all that good stuff from Yale. And I really felt that Cien Años de Soledad was the best written novel I had ever read. Absolutely. And just let me put a quick plug mm-hmm. in for any kind of, I don't know, who it might be, younger readers or something. This is probably the, the peak of that's ever been achieved in fiction. A mm-hmm. hundred years of solitude. It's available in great English translation. Wonderful, wonderful translation. It's it, it it's like for me, it's like it was virtual reality before anyone thought about virtual reality. My favorite moment is the ant who, whenever she arrives, whenever she appears, there are golden butterflies. Butterflies. Remedios right. la bella. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I then, I haven't read the novel in the last twenty years, though. I read it at least a dozen times because I also taught the novel when I taught uh, right. uh, Spanish at Phillips Academy Andover. I taught yeah. it. But, um, so yeah, I'm just a big fan and so I was very fortunate when I wrote my novel The Twelve, yeah. the international publisher for the Spanish language edition was Editorial Planeta which just happens to be the same publishing company. They, they are the largest Spanish publisher in the world and they were Gabriel Garcia Marquez's publisher. And I just was fortunate that my editor was his editor. Right. So when I learned that, I asked her to give a signed copy of my novel in Spanish to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And he, in exchange, uh, read the novel and enjoyed it and sent me a copy of his novel in which he had crossed out on the title page Soledad and written Cien Años de Felicidad. A hundred years of happiness. A hundred years of happiness para mi me, colega y amigo to my colleague and friend William wow. Gladstone. Fantastic. So a very personal, nice. well crafted wow. message as you would expect from the wow. greatest writer I think of the yeah, you 20th probably century in, in, in and, and so that you know I, I, and I think this is relevant to this discussion you know what is the state of books will we ever have writers as fabulous as Gabriel Garcia Marquez I mean is there and will they be read well will they be read yes will they be written I think there'll be some great novels written not 
quite as great. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to come together for truly great literature. It's interesting you say it that way, because, you know, I would, I would assume it's the other way, that we may have great literature written, but do people have the attention span to read? Well, it's interesting. There is not less reading going on. There's less reading of full-length books, mm. but there's not less reading. Mm -hmm. So people still know how to read. And in fact, if you look at literacy rates around the world, they're higher than they've ever been. There's more readers alive today yeah. than at any moment in history. But are they reading full-length novels? For the most part, no. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they won't okay. if something can break through mm -hmm. the clutter. What we're finding, like even, and, and some people may disagree with it, this, even what I would consider mediocre novels. Go Set a Watchman, I thought, was very mediocre. That was uh, oh, right. Harper Lee's yeah. original first draft uh -huh. that she had not wanted to have published, but after her death was published. And The original of Catcher in the Rye? No, 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 no. The, the original of, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. It's, it's the famous movie with Gregory Peck, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay, yeah. So To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a fabulous book, and it was a fabulous movie, was actually the second draft of an earlier manuscript with the same characters, but, you know, rougher writing and not as polished, of a manuscript that was published, I believe it's now two or three years ago, called Set a, Go Set a Watchman. Or Set. Anyway, I, I couldn't even read it. it. It was very mediocre. But it sold over a million copies in the first week because of the connection because to of who, it was, of who she it was. Wouldn't, it wouldn't have done that. It was a first novel. Oh, as a first novel, it wouldn't have, it, no one would have read it. Yeah. But I, I bring this up as an example because it's not... And, and uh, you know, another good example along these lines is the Harry Potter phenomena. Yeah. Millions, hundreds of millions, well, at least 100 million collectively, if you look at all the novels, have been read. At least they've been purchased. I can't guarantee they've been read. But they've been purchased. That's a huge number. Gone with the Wind was the novel of its decade, and it did not sell, you know, right. more than a few million. Yeah. So the idea that people aren't reading... I think is not the problem. Okay. The problem is there's so much noise. People will read something if they feel compelled to, if they feel they, it's part of the cultural dialogue of the moment. What is disturbing to me is that there's no legitimate filter of what is worthy and what is not. Yeah. It's too much of a free-for-all. I mean, there's some good things about it. We've gotten rid of the quote-unquote gatekeepers. That was the big problem. Oh, you have all these white Anglican, well, they're mostly women anyway, but, you know, it still was politically incorrect. They're all, you know, the big push in publishing is we have to have diversity of diversity. And it's a good thing because 98% of publishing was purely white mm -hmm. until probably 20, 30 years ago. Well, if you go back to the 50s, it was also the publishing houses were run by men. Well, they were in the mm -hmm. 50s. But yeah. so, so the, and, and so the whole idea of, you know, we had gatekeepers. But like anything, um, there's good and bad in almost all situations. Mm -hmm. And there was some standards and there were some great books published. Um, right now, I don't know what is determining. I, I mean, I send things out. What somebody calls a great novel and sells is bewildering. I mean, I've read a lot of good books that I can't get published at all. If you're enjoying this podcast with Arjuna Arda and his radically brilliant guest, you might also enjoy our eight-week online group coaching program. It's an opportunity to go deep and get stable in practices that enhance your own brilliance. We only take 20 participants at a time, so in a small and intimate group, you can go through the whole Radical Brilliance cycle. You'll have an accountability partner in another brilliant aspirant from somewhere around the world. The eight-week coaching program involves eight one-hour webinars with Arjuna Arda and a group of other Radical Brilliance coaches. 
You'll also receive one 30-minute coaching session with your own personal coach every week and one 90-minute coaching session with Arjuna himself. It's the ideal opportunity to drop deep into yourself, into the source of your own creativity, and to get support for an entire eight weeks of mining your own radical brilliance and bringing it forth into a project or creation that can truly serve the future of humanity. Find out more at RadicalBrilliance.com and click on the Programs tab. Well, let's expand beyond mm-hmm. novel now to yeah. books generally, because I know a lot of a lot of the mm-hmm. books you've had the greatest impact with were not fiction. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to also do a do a bit of a flip now to to the perspective of someone who has something to contribute. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know I, I'm a coach. I have coaching clients. You're a literary agent. You have authors, but I frequently have connection with people who have who have something to contribute, which fairly obviously is going to uplift the collective. It's going to be an upgrade in well, their industry. this is really the reason, in addition to our primary activities, which generate over 95% of our revenue, which is the agenting, we have our own publishing. We call it a hybrid publishing relationship, White Gloves, Amazon. Amazon will publish any book we present them as a Kindle with the option for print on demand, and they will promote any book. That's the contractual obligation. And the reason they're doing this is they are hoping that some of our best-selling authors will choose this option, and some of them are. Mm -hmm. So it's a win for Amazon, and it's part of Amazon's Machiavellian desire to eliminate all of the major publishers in the long run, which they may succeed in doing. But in the short term, my function is to assist my specific authors, and I've given up any hope of dismantling Amazon. So I'm fine working in partnership with them Mm. and taking advantage of what they are offering in this moment, despite the clear concerns we all should have of having one company be in a monopolistic position controlling future culture. But in the short term, um, Amazon is actually contributing to diversity because they are, through their KDB program and our program, making it very cost-effective to self-publish. Yeah. We consider what we are doing right. hybrid publishing. because well, basically we, just the cost we, of we bring, time. We bring in, well, you still, we, we call it hybrid because we insist on quality. We insist on editors. We insist yeah. on book designers and yeah. cover designers. I mean, they're self-publishing without standards and then they're self-publishing with standards. Yeah. So we think you know, let's keep the standards. But the future for someone who has something important to contribute is excellent. They may not be able to find a traditional publisher, right. but that doesn't mean they can't find a way to a publish point. their That's book. That's a good point. So if we look at this, if we look at, look at somebody in their particular industry, let's mm-hmm. say, you know, I, I'm working with somebody right now in medicine who has completely game-changing ideas about medicine, mm-hmm. simple ideas. Those kind of ideas are when you hear it, you go, yeah, of course, why didn't anyone say that before? You know, mm-hmm. and, and there's a lot of people in different industries. This is what's sometimes called you know, disruptive thinking or mm-hmm. disruptive mm-hmm. economics, where you just you ask this question, like, who says it has to be that way and reinvent it? Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is, in a way, today it's better than ever, although people are kind of distracted by YouTube and uh, other, you know, and, and, and the easy availability of entertainment on their laptop computer, you're saying in a way it's better than ever because the, the, the possibility of being able to get into print is much easier than it has been. Much before. easier. The potential less, is yeah. there. And there's they, less of a delay as well. Oh, right? much yeah. faster. Yeah. Um, you, can, the, you can finish your manuscript yeah, the next the, day. The, the, the problem, seven. of course, is, you know, and there's different terms for it, but discoverability is yeah. the big term. Yeah. How is anyone going to discover that the book you just spent six years yeah. writing and six months organizing for publication, mm. how is anyone even going to know it exists? Right. That's one of the reasons you know, we're happy with the White Gloves program. At least we get some initial promotion yeah. from Amazon. But for someone just doing it on their own, it's all up to them. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm thinking actually, I'd like to get back to somebody thinking about writing a book, you know? Mm-hmm. So, Let's, let's go back to like, why would you do that? If you have something to contribute in your, in your field, 
and you, you, you're you thinking, well, I could write a book, but I could not, you know, because I'm probably not going to sell a million copies anymore. Like, well, you're probably not going to sell a thousand. Or exactly. The average self-published book sells fewer than 200 copies. Right. So, so would you say based on that statistic, don't even bother? Or, no, not no. at all. The main okay. reason to write a book mm -hmm. is to organize your own thoughts. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's nothing more challenging than taking your ideas and organizing them in a way that you understand them better and you can make someone else understand them better. Yeah. Um, on the level of memoirs, you have a lot of people writing memoirs. The main benefit to writing a memoir is the cathartic experience of writing right. it and yeah. having a better understanding of what led you to where you are today. Exactly. So no one's going to read your memoir, you know, mm. unless you give it to them. People you knew. People you knew or yeah. if course you become very famous then yeah. they will but yeah. and there, there's always going to be that one or two rare exceptions uh you know i don't follow all these but i know they've made some movies of some memoirs from people who weren't famous at the time i think yeah. there's wild or something was one with some reese witherspoon i think was the actress Oscar wild? no no wild wild oh wild, right yeah called. yeah about a woman who goes yeah goes, yeah, on reese, hike, goes, hiking. goes yeah. hiking i mean yeah. the chances of that i actually read it. that before it was a movie yeah. it was a very well written novel yeah it's a great novel yeah well her name cheryl i i, I yeah. didn't read it so i don't yeah, know I'm just, just, i was just throwing that out as an very example good read. i don't read i mean novels, or in the non-fiction area i think this this uh there's a book I, I can't remember her she's the number one right now hollis i think girl wash your face okay. apparently it's, it's got some kind of christian connection i haven't read the book but again out of nowhere and yeah. this book is selling very well so okay. it happens but if you look at it it's, it's literally like buying the lottery ticket yeah it's exactly it's, yeah. it's literally one out of a hundred thousand yeah so for most people if you're going to write your memoir you're writing it because you need to write it. It's important mm. to you to connect with your own story mm. and the hope that you know, people who know you at least will be moved by it. So and yeah, and actually, maybe there's a, there's a long shot that somehow your story is universal and someone's gonna connect with it and it'll lead to getting the movie made and you know, yeah. there you go. I think what, what, what I'm hearing you're pointing to is a distinction that maybe we would be benefited to come back to is, is the notion of creating because it wants to be created or creating because there's something to be expressed and to some degree letting go of the idea of how many people are going oh, to... Oh, absolutely. Okay. You, you, I mean, there's, there's different moments in time for someone to write a book because they have information that is absolutely critical to a large number of people yeah. and it must be written and shared and yeah. you know in, in a sense i would say even some of the the computer how to books we did were like yeah. that i mean there's yeah. when they first came out with windows people were desperate that you know yeah. how do you use this stuff right. so uh -huh. that yeah. was clearly and you know fortunately for everyone involved had tremendous commercial potential yeah. Yeah. other books it may more be like the world is headed in the wrong direction you know, like the first, like I, I'd, I'd say Al Gore's book at the time he did it was yeah. a good wake up call for humanity. Mm. Um, you know, but Al Gore had previously been the vice president. Yes, of, the of course. So, or, or which which came first actually? Was it the book or the? Or no, the, he had already been vice okay. president. Yeah. So what? About, I mean, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize for you know. So what? About, here's here's what I what I noticed a lot is somebody who really cares. Mm -hmm. They really want the world to be a better place. They've got their angle on it, mm -hmm. but. You know, like you said, there's a one in a 100,000 chance of, of... Well, there election. are things they can do to increase their chances to maybe one in 10,000, yeah. which is still good. You know, okay. not, so what are not those great. things? Well, you should do some of the things you're doing. You should create a blog. You should contribute go to... Go interview your literary agent. <laughs> well, no, don't be a literary agent, but... No, I no, said go interview your literary oh, agent. Oh, go yeah. interview, uh, perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, most people can't get a literary agent. You yeah. had you had enough going that you could. It's not easy to get a literary it's my agent. Good looks, I think, but it's but um, you need to self-promote no matter what you do, even for yeah. people who are successful. People don't authors. like to do that. You know, pe people who like to write often don't. They, they, they That's feel, true. They but it's beneath them to self-promote. Well, but there's, there's different ways of looking at it. I've never looked at it as self-promotion so much as sharing information right. if you have important information to share yeah. share it right and if it was worth your time to write the book it certainly is worth your time to promote your book and to what, get what is what is in i mean you've i think you told me you told me about somebody who was it now you were telling me about a book you, that's, i think it's not even come out yet somebody somebody was talking about how he got like a million 
likes on Facebook or something. It was somebody had a formula for doing that. Oh yeah, one yeah. million followers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I just had lunch with that author yesterday. Is he? Is it out? The book? The book just came out. I'll give you a copy. You oh, can use it. I, I, okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's I'm a too... great book. One million followers I by Brendan I, I, Kane, Ben yeah. Bella Publishing. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a book that everyone who's serious right. about promotion should. Well, obviously, if Follow. everyone had a million followers, it would be very chaotic. But but obviously, some people have a million followers. But what are the what are, what are the most important principles of getting your work to the right people? And before you answer that mm-hmm. question, I want to actually throw a little spice in the mix here. Look, you know, I was talking to um, Lisa Sasevich, who lives just down the road. Mm-hmm. You know, Lisa? No, I don't. Because she's a she's an expert in this kind of stuff. You know, marketing, and she used this term. Um, message to market. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you've got something specific to say, you don't have to reach everybody. Mm-hmm. You need to reach the people to whom that particular message mm-hmm. is relevant. And that might, you know, if in if you're Jack Canfield with Chicken Soup for the Soul, then millions of people may be your ticket. But if you've got something that could really improve the life of anesthetologists who live in very humid climates. Maybe there's a particular mm-hmm. problem that anesthetologists in, in humid climates have. It's a very small number of people that you need to reach in, in a very targeted way for, for you to be able to say mission accomplished. Now, that's a f- facetious example. But a lot of people have things to share. Like, you know, somebody who's recovered from alcoholism, mm-hmm. their message might be particularly relevant to alcoholics, but not to, not to everybody. Mm-hmm. So, so when we talk about numbers, there's also a question of choosing a, well, a, a target. Well, and, I mean, this, you make two points that are very close to my way of thinking about why we do what we do. Mm. One is, it's very important that we maintain cultural diversity. Yeah. And just as we have biological diversity, and we're losing a lot of that, mm. um, we're also using, losing cultural diversity. Um, and as any biologist will tell you, it's not the number of units of a particular species that's going extinct. It's the diversity as a whole. Mm-hmm. And it's true here if you are making the cultural analysis because it doesn't matter if you're only reaching 10 or 20 people. If it's a group mm-hmm. that would not have any presence at all, mm-hmm. that's important to the collective. Yeah. And the other thing that you can mm. think about, mm. when we started with our books about how to use computers, the audience was very, very small. Let's stay with that point for a minute, because just, you just yeah. touched me so much in what you just said. Because mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of, I just, as you said mm-hmm. that, I, my mind started coming to examples of tiny subcultures, mm-hmm. which when they don't have a voice, um, suffer a kind of marginalization mm-hmm. and often a kind of bullying. Uh, and and a, 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 um, a really good example of this is people who feel, um, I don't know quite the politically correct terms, but people who feel, uh, who don't want to be gender defined, mm-hmm. who, don't, who don't really mm-hmm. primarily identify with masculine or feminine. Mm-hmm. And that just, that, that just wasn't given voice, you know, 50 years ago. Or even well, this ago. is one, I think, of the positive sides of what's going on. Yeah. Because particularly in the beginning when you have a group that we did not think was very large. Mm. I mean, collect, you know, compared to normal groupings, mm. it's not very large. Yeah. But it was much larger than anyone realized. Exactly. Large right. enough to justify exactly. traditional publishing. Exactly. But in the beginning, I don't know the, the details, but I would venture to say in the last 10 to 15 years as self-publishing started, probably the beginnings of that uh, group of ideas was probably more self-published than traditionally published and then it grows from there the analogy i was going to make before is even if we go back i mean it's hard for anyone listening to this to believe but in 1980 1976 was the first personal computer in 1980 when we started with the computer books there were very small audiences for many of these i mean our our i remember the Mm -hmm. first uh book we did on at the time it was called arpnet we actually delayed because I was talking with Sid Karen at UCSD, who was in charge of the Supercomputer Center, and he told me about this ARPNET. And I said, well, how many people are using it? He said, oh, about 10,000. I said, that's not enough to justify a book. When you've got 100,000 people, right. get back to me. And, of course, yeah. that became the Internet. Yeah. 
But we had other technology. Oh, right, right. The internet. <laughs> yeah, okay. We had other technologies, but but that's part of the point also. You can't predict the future. Yeah. And so you may have a group that is quite small, but it can become quite large. As you're listening to this conversation with Arjuna Arda and his radically brilliant guest, you might feel inspired to go deeper into your own expression of radical brilliance. Come join us for a one-week Radical Brilliance Laboratory held in a beautiful rural location in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. During the laboratory, you'll have an opportunity to dive deeply into all four quadrants of the Brilliance Cycle. This means you'll be able to explore experiences of consciousness without boundaries. And you'll be able to start accessing original impulses of creativity from within yourself that can become your unique contribution to the world. You can get in touch with your own learning and integrate mistakes that will allow you to mature and grow. You'll have the chance to deeply mine your own resources as well as connect with other brilliant people in a small, intimate context for a week. You can check out the Radical Brilliance Laboratories at RadicalBrilliance.com under the Events tab. But, you know, you can't predict the future, but you can have a stab at creating the future. Yes. I I think you have equal opportunity in both areas. (laughs) Right. Well, that's actually, I mean, predicting the future is often going to be opportunistic. Mm -hmm. But wanting to create the future, like you've got, I know you've got grandchildren now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've you've often shown me pictures. Right, right. I love my little kids. In fact, walking into the... uh, Walking into the, your office today, I thought, wow, that's an awfully small bicycle for Bill. Yeah. <laughs> There's a tiny little bicycle there. Yeah, so you care about your grandchildren, mm-hmm. which means they've, because of the increase in life expectancy, mm-hmm. your grandchildren are probably going to see another 100 years, you know, mm-hmm. right? So what, with that awareness, we can start thinking about what is the contribution that we can inject into the collective, however modest it may be, that shifts the future in the direction that we want to create. Well, absolutely. I mean, that is, I mean, if you look at our website, our, I don't know whether you call it mission statement or Mm -hmm. we just put it up there. We didn't think of it as that, but is to help authors and publishers create and distribute books that will create a better world. And, and, you know, that's really what it's all about because we're not living in the 19th century. Yeah. We're not even living in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. We can't just do business as usual. We yeah. can't right. follow a materialistic model right. of let's just create more and more for ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's not sustainable. Beautiful. And if you do take the 100-year view... As a minimum, you know. There, there's, there's, there's disaster ahead. Right. And it's not just about survival. Mm-hmm. It's about quality of life. Yeah. And, you know, when you have grandchildren, and I'll probably live long enough to have great-grandchildren, um, you want to have quality of life for yes. your children, grandchildren, and exactly. great-grandchildren. So, so how does publishing fit into that? Well, I think publishing has a very important role because, mm-hmm. yes, there's a lot you can do with tweets and apps, mm-hmm. but to really develop a full concept, yes. you often need a full book. Right. The other reason is if... You look at the entertainment side, and I think the entertainment side is underrated for its importance because people are moved more through novels than nonfiction. Absolutely. And if you can create a novel where you have characters that you really care with and about and identify with, you're more likely to have an emotional catharsis within yourself and to become aware of something new. And so... You can't do that. You can do it, you know, different people, you know, have had success. You can be a great short story writer in novellas, but, yeah. but there's certain times when you really need a full book. Did you ever, so I don't ever think that, you know, full-length novels will disappear. Did you ever represent 
gay uh, gay Henry. Yes, I, I still do. Yeah. yeah. What, what did you what, what, what did well, you? Well, we just did one of his nonfiction books. We did his three you novels. Did? You did the, the three the, novels. The, I, the, I actually the, introduced the, Gay to Tinker Lindsay, who, who mm-hmm. co-created those with him. But yeah, we, we have a lot of fun. He's yeah. a brilliant, well, brilliant writer. Gay actually gave me this little formula years ago. He said, if you've got something to say, say it really briefly in a paragraph, then tell an amazing mm. tear-jerking story that illustrates what you just said, and then, and then sum it up at the end. And once he explained that to me, I started looking mm-hmm. at, these, at, at his books, and sure enough, they <laughs> all follow that formula. Everything's like... Here's something to think about. Here's the story. Now, what do you think about yeah. what you do? And there's nothing wrong with following a formula because the formula is just the structure. Yeah. It's the individual story, the story is where minds, you get yeah. the creativity. And that's, of course, you know, yeah. chicken, chicken soup. Which, yeah, uh, Jack Canfield. Jack Canfield, and is pro- I think it's probably the best, what is it, the best-selling, I mean, it's, I think it's 500 million. Well, that's that's including, including that's, that includes the Chinese, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. Well, which is why hard would we to exclude dispute. the Chinese? A, well, because, well, I, he never got paid, so, <laughs> as an agent, I'm only, she's okay. paid for. Still, 500 million people have bought those books, yeah. whatever mm-hmm. the economics, so, and those are stories, you know, those mm-hmm. are actually make, those are mm-hmm. making points through telling stories, so that's a, it's a super important insight mm-hmm. we can bring to this, that, Actually, you know, and that's the work that I do in, in coaching people. And I, I've mm-hmm. got, I only take seven people a year in coaching. Mm-hmm. And most of them end up actually, I mean, half, mm-hmm. more than half end up writing books that I help them with. And the biggest thing I have to explain to people is you can put as great a concept as you like together, but it's going to leave people cold. It just goes to their head. Illustrate your concept with a story. Mm-hmm. You've won everybody's hearts, you know. Well... In the beginning, before we had books, we had storytelling. Around the fire. And there's a reason we had storytelling. And if you look at the myths, if you go back, I was a student of Claude Levi-Strauss in anthropology, and there's no society that has been identified that doesn't have creation myths, yeah. that doesn't have um, the equivalent of Aesop's fables of good and evil. And yeah. I mean, it was how societies nurtured their young with yeah. their stories yeah yeah beautiful I want to start um, bringing this to a graceful landing mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I want to think about somebody who resonates with what we talked about like the hundred year future you know mm-hmm. the future that we don't even get to see but, mm-hmm. we, but we got to contribute to so I meet so many people who care that way, who really, mm-hmm. who at least want to make sure that their life is maximally contributing to the solution and not contributing to the destruction. Mm-hmm. Somebody like that listening to us talk, who might have the seat, that, who's, who's got something to contribute. Let's think of a few takeaway bits of advice, you know, from, from, from so much experience of, of, of where, where you could get started with, with writing a book. You've already given us some advice about knowing well, you. Mm. Use your your village. Yeah. I mean that's why you know all the millennials talk about their tribe. Yeah. So have involvement with your tribe. You you know, mm. there's a group of people out there who have interests similar to yours, whatever they might be. Mm. Communicate with those people, see how you can help them. Yeah. And in that process, something may evolve for you, you that enables you to share your particular passion mm-hmm. with a larger audience. Oh, beautiful. And also that by helping, it's really the key that I've learned through everything that we do, um, it's really by helping others that you help yourself the most. Yeah, totally. Because when you get out of your ego and you really get into the purpose and you are able to identify the needs of others, that magic happens. Yeah. I mean, that's where the miracles come from. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. It's great advice. What, do you, what are your preferences on, you know, capturing insights? Because insights tend to pop up in all sorts of, you know, I have this kind of Murphy's Law that I'm going to have my best ideas when I don't have a voice recorder available, you know. So what, what are your... Well, I don't, I don't record, you know... I, I, when I meet with, I have certain clients mm-hmm. that I think are going to be great, and so we do record, um, particularly if they've not written before because they don't necessarily know how to write a book. So to get the raw mm-hmm. information, we just sit and talk and record, nice. and yeah. sometimes it leads to books and sometimes it doesn't. Right. 
But you know, that's if, how you did with uh, with Marissa. Marissa. Yeah, that, that's how we, we we didn't know where it was headed. In the case of Marissa, I did feel that she was bringing through. She's a trans channel. I didn't know what a trans channel was. Mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily even believe in it. But as I met with her and and things happened that had no logical scientific explanation, I truly did become a believer that she was bringing through very rare information that yeah. could have significant long-term value. Yeah. So that was really our only motivation to kind of create an archive of these. And then we did turn them into books, not so much that we've done anything commercially with them at all, but mm-hmm. just so that we had a written, uh, edited version of the transcripts. So that's a very useful way of, of recording ideas. In terms of shorter inspirational things, nothing's wrong with this hundred word and less uh, tweeting world or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's much less than 100 words. Well, uh, it, it used to be 140 characters. Now, now it's 280. 280 yeah. Okay, well, you're getting closer to 50 words, certainly. Yeah, yeah you can run but, a whole country. Yeah, you, well, apparently. <laughs> or, or run it into the ground, either way. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, short... You know, I, I don't use Twitter personally. I right. just... But I don't use technology. I have other people do all that for me. I have, when a, a book of mine comes out, they'll ask me to write some tweets, and I'll just write 100 tweets, and then people send them. Okay. But, um, you know, I'm spoiled and privileged. But um, for those of you who don't have a staff of people to, you know, do everything for you, yeah, they're, they're engaging in the right proportion with social media and getting feedback that way, whether it's through LinkedIn or some of these other uh, opportunities, can be useful. You, know, you just don't want to overdo. I mean, yeah. I'm the extreme. I have never gone on Facebook. I have a Facebook page. People do that for me. I know. I've tried but to I, stalk you many I, times. I, I, I've never been on Instagram. I've never been on anything. Right. That's probably extreme. Mm-hmm. But... If you had one extreme, I'd take my extreme over those who spend three, four, or five hours a day on this stuff. Right. That is not healthy, and it's sure. not going to get you anywhere. But it's like everything. Use your technology appropriately, 10, 20 minutes a day. I mean, uh, something related to, you know, how do you get your inspiration out? I, I just agreed to help, uh, and, and you should do this just with your own writing. The Vibe, have I told talk to you about the vibe the vibe the vibe vibe.me it's great new service it's an app okay and we've got some of our authors like barbara DeAngelis and neil donald walsh doing things for the vibe and then we have our own waterside channel and basically it's i think you pay two or three dollars a month and every day you get a new vibe message that resonates with you know whatever your area of interest is it, it's a lot about mindfulness uh, right. you, you would resonate with it so okay, cool. i'll definitely if nothing else connect you to the vibe. Vibe me up. (laughs) I'll vibe you up. If you're enjoying this podcast, you might enjoy dropping by RadicalBrilliance.com. We've got an ebook for you which explains the Radical Brilliance cycle, the way the cycle gets blocked, and the practices that best open up the cycle again. We also have five days of gifts and insights for you, delivered every day by email and video, which go much more deeply into the phases of the cycle, the ways that the cycle can become a kind of diagnosis of blocked brilliance, and a way to accurately find the right practice for each person. In addition, you'll receive a video about the single most important practice that we have determined affects brilliance, and another video about everyone's favorite topic, brilliant sex. It's all totally free, prepared for you as our guest. Please come to RadicalBrilliance.com. Register on the homepage and you'll receive the ebook right away. Then you'll be guided through the five days of videos to take you deeper into your own radical brilliance. You know, one of the things that happens that I've noticed when people aspire to writing a book or completing a book is you get all kinds of discouraged, you get very discouraged along the way. So a lot of, it's the classic thing that you know, people start, start books, the, the, the 
the heroic things when you finish it. Many people start and don't finish because they get well. That I have the easy solution, though yeah. it's easy for me. I don't know if it is for the others. What is it? But the, the easiest solution is you write an outline. Mm-hmm. You set a hour or two a day, the yeah. same time, same place every nice. day. Yeah, an hour and, or two. An hour or two, mm-hmm. and that hour or two, you're going to sit down and write, whether you're inspired or not. Okay. And you're going to follow your outline, yeah. and it may be some days you'll end up throwing away everything you wrote. Uh-huh. But just developing that discipline and that routine. Right. If you do that, you will. You can add it up, but you know you can write depending on the length of the book. Yeah. You're guaranteed in six months to have a finished book. So, how many people have you given that advice to? Not enough, but I only give advice when I'm asked. Okay, okay, okay. But, but you, that seems to work. Out really I, it, good. It, it works very well. Nice. I, I mean, nice. There, yeah, and there's always interview. You know, first of all, easy to say, set aside an hour a day. Yeah. Some people, you know, they're mothers with young children. They yeah. they also have a full time job. Right. They you know they don't have an hour a day. Hmm. Though I just read an article. At, the timing happens to be uh, Publishers Weekly. Just last week had an article by a, a writer who was single when she started and she wanted to keep writing. Now she has young children. She gets up at 5 a.m. every day and yeah. writes for an hour and a half. There you go. Um, so you can do it if you want to. All right. And it, it just has to be important enough. And Sweet. you make the time for it. I mean, people go to the gym for an hour. People go, you know, have other activities. If it's important enough and you make the time and you schedule it and yeah. you create your routine around it, it'll work. And particularly, I think if you do all that, and keep in mind the well-being of the grandchildren of your grandchildren. That's a, that's a really great motivator. To, to well, m- even more importantly, I mean, there's no question the well-being of your grandchildren, and, you know, but your own well-being. Yeah. It's, it's really, because in the end, you can't help anyone unless you're coming from your highest and best yeah. self. Yeah. And for many people, writing is not just cathartic, but enlightening. Yeah. In the process of writing, mm. you learn about yourself mm-hmm. and you learn about the world. Mm-hmm. I started when I was 15. I was inspired by Albert Camus, the oh, yeah. prize-winning novelist. The Outsider. The Outsider, The Plague, The yeah. Fall, you know, many books. I remember primarily that. It's kind of suicidal fiction. Well, it was existential. Yeah. It existential. Fiction to but but compared, com- well, compared to Sartre, who was his contemporary, he was more upbeat so start you know yeah. with with yeah. you know nausea and yeah. was was yeah that was terrible com- yeah but Come my on. point is not I grew up on that with leonard cohen okay <laughs> but but um the the positive because i started not with any of those novels but with yeah. albert camus notebooks okay he kept notebooks ah. and they were very inspirational i recommend anyone who's interested in becoming a writer to read his notebooks because you learn more about the development of a writer and the development of a mind. That's great. And some of his entries were very short, Mm -hmm. two, three words, Mm -hmm. and some were much longer. And I was inspired by those notebooks to start journaling myself. And I have other clients. Patricia Aberdeen is one who comes to mind who is the co-author of Megatrends, a book that sold three million copies. And, And Patricia to this day, journals almost okay. daily. So just writing for yourself mm. is valuable. Mm. And if it turns into a book, all the better. And in the process of connecting with your highest and best self, you will be making a positive contribution to the future of your children and grandchildren. Fantastic. Bill, thanks so much for taking oh, the time today. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Bill Gladstone, who, as I told you before, is not only a very prestigious agent, but he represents me. So having heard that conversation with Bill, I'd like to ask you to reflect upon the book that most wants to be born through you. If you were to write a book not for money, not for fame, but simply because it's the most accurate, honest expression of your heart, what would that book be? Take a few minutes to contemplate um, with all of the uncertainties of publishing if you wrote a book simply because you have to, simply because it demands to be given birth through you, what would that book be? See you next time 
on the next episode of the Radical Brilliance podcast.